Hello and welcome to this review of my Apple Extended Keyboard, commonly known as the AEK. This was one of the more requested Redux videos, so I decided to redo this one, as the original review is more than two years old by now, and a lot has happened since. Originally I didn't have a cable or a converter for it, but I found two new old stock cables for it on eBay at £1.20, and Tom aka Hizza very kindly made me a converter for it that I've been using for ages now, and coupled with the fact I've since acquired many more Apple keyboards and learned a lot more about them, there's now much more to tell and discuss about this. The Apple Extended Keyboard, or Model M0115, was one of the keyboards you'd get with the Macintosh 2 in 1987. You could buy either this full-size, more expensive option, or the cheaper and smaller Apple Standard Keyboard, Model M0116, which I also reviewed previously. Both were made by Alps Electric in the USA and Ireland, who have been responsible for quite a few of Apple's keyboards, and both are often agreed to be the best keyboards Apple ever made. My personal preference is of course for the full size AEK, but the more space saving M0116 is also quite popular. The AEK is an extremely typical Apple product with several highly questionable design decisions that straddle the line of being outright pedantic or even arrogant, but the truth is that this is simply an outstanding keyboard and I'm never disappointed whenever I break it out for a spin. This keyboard is from the period in which Steve Jobs was not a part of Apple, and as a result, the keyboard is rather large and heavy. At just under 1.8 kilos and 48.5 centimeters long, it's both the biggest and heaviest keyboard Apple ever made, to my knowledge. Even its successor, the AEK2, is ever so slightly smaller and lighter. Compare it to its modern full-size cousin, the Apple Aluminium keyboard, and you can see how it's not just much longer, wider, and taller, but also 3.5 times as heavy. The results, of course, speak for themselves. It's fantastic. Built by Alps Electric in the USA and in Ireland in a former Apple plant, these things boast strong, thick plastic cases and a thick metal mounting plate to hold everything together. In short, excellent build quality. On a side note, and I've dimmed one of the lights a little bit in order to show you this better, the cases are made out of a plastic that appears to yellow at an exceptional rate. This particular one is only really, really yellow, but as you can see from my M0116, it could actually go orange or even worse. The case has a swooping curved shape, which is rather distinctive, but there is no way to adjust the angle of the keyboard as keyboard feet were deliberately not included. Now, the native angle of the keyboard is pretty good for me, but it just blows my mind how they came up with the arrogance to leave out the flip out feet on these. Something they later corrected with the AEK2's rather bizarre monopod foot. It used ADB ports, which were introduced with the Apple II GS a year earlier. The ADB port, which stands for Apple Desktop Bus, by the way, precedes the much more widespread PS2 port introduced by IBM by a year and had a feature that PS2 didn't have, you could daisy chain several devices through a single port. That's why the keyboard actually has two of these ports on it. You were supposed to plug a mouse into the port on the right and then daisy chain it through the keyboard into a single port on the computer. PS2 systems notably used separate ports for either and they weren't interchangeable. Mice couldn't speak to keyboard PS2 ports and vice versa. It's a clever idea, but it didn't catch on as much as IBM's PS2 ports because Apple simply didn't have the market presence IBM did. It should be noted that Apple's now famous penchant for changing the cables on their devices every year was absent during this period of Jobs' extended leave and the ADB port remained Apple's standard keyboard connector for 12 years. ADB can be converted to USB through the use of a simple converter, although, as you can probably guess, commercial converters such as the Griffin iMate are very expensive at about $60 from Amazon. You can, however, wire up a converter of your own for a few dollars, if you're willing and able to do so. ADB connectors look like PS2 connectors, but they only use four pins instead of six, and the bar pin is horizontal instead of vertical. ADB cables can be had for a tenner or so on eBay, although a more economical alternative is the S-Video cable, which you can get brand new for two pounds or so. It's fully compatible. The original ADB cables, like this one, were pretty thick grain, had loads of coils in them, so they stretched pretty comfortably, which is good because they weren't very long. Like I said, you were supposed to have a mouse on one side and the keyboard cable on the other, which means that there's a lot of cableage that can be in the way a bit compared to systems that had cables coming out of the back, especially ones with a cable gutter, which this keyboard doesn't have. 
This particular keyboard uses Salmon Alps switches, but older ones could also come with Orange Alps. According to some community members, you can make a general estimate of whether these keyboards have Salmon or Orange Alps based on the serial number. If it's below 500,000, it's likely to be Orange Alps. As this one is almost twice that, it makes sense that it'd be Salmon Alps. Also, interestingly, even though I picked this keyboard up from a recycling center in the UK, it was actually made in the USA and the keyboard has a US layout. Both Orange and Salmon Alps are tactile, non-clicky switches, and although Salmon Alps are not as old as Orange Alps, they still retain several design features of the older switches. The biggest difference between the two is really the weighting. Salmon Alps are at the more usual weight of 70 grams of force, while Orange Alps are a little lighter at 60. Think of them as a generation one and a half switch. They're excellent switches, and although I prefer the lighter weighting of Orange Alps, these Salmons are super nice to use. Really gives other tactile switches a run for their money. They feel fantastic. And, of course, as you would expect of Alp switches, they come with a killer soundtrack. Noise. Just to compare it to the competition, here's what they sound like compared to Cherry MX Brown. Now, despite being non-clicky switches, as you would expect of Alps, they aren't exactly quiet. In fact, they're louder than some clicky switches I know. But by Jove, who wouldn't want to bask in a typing noise like this? As always, with Alps, make sure you get a board that's as clean as possible and that's seen the littlest possible use. This one might be a tad yellow, but it's definitely in very nice condition, so it's great to type on. I'd imagine they'd be even better than this when new old stock, though. Overall, Salmon Alps are a very nice tactile switch. Of course, with clicky switches, it's hard to truly beat IBM switches, such as capacitive buckling springs and beam springs, but for non-clicky tactile switches, I'd honestly say Alps are some of the best picks out there. The keycaps are very high quality, being thick PBT with dye sublimed lettering. PBT is a material that doesn't yellow upon exposure to light, which is why the case has yellowed so much, but the caps haven't. The spacebar is evidently not PBT though, which is why it matches the color of the case. Now, I know some people really like the oblique and really narrow lettering that's in the lower left corner instead of the upper left one where it belongs, but I find it looking really silly, to be honest. It's just about the one thing I don't like about these keycaps. Dye sublimation is a printing method that IBM also used for their keycaps. It's extremely durable, and although it's not as high contrast or sharp as double-shot lettering, it's still very high quality. In fact, Apple keyboards are common PBT keycap donors for Alps boards, but a few caps are sometimes a non-standard size, such as the keys on the right here, so you'd have to find a way around that. Also, the F keys use tall stems and are rotated 90 degrees, so you can't use these on most keyboards or vice versa. Also, in another bout of Apple weirdness, they stuck the homing dots on D and K instead of F and J, which I guess could really bother some people. Apple kept up this practice for a very long time. AEKs are considerably rarer than the later AEK2 and therefore also a bit more expensive. So if you want to use it as a platform to modify with different switches, I recommend the AEK2 or a Dell 8101 instead, partly because those are much more common and cheap, but also because the stock switches in these aren't as good as the ones in the AEK. You can of course still linearize these switches or click mod them, which makes them a bit lighter and alters the sound going from to but I'd say the stock switches are really excellent and they don't need any modification. Again, I'd recommend an AEK2 or Dell 8101 for any of these modifications. So in conclusion, I'd say that yes, this is the best keyboard Apple ever made, at least in my opinion. The 2C with Amber Alps is also spectacularly good, but that one is much more complicated to adapt, doesn't come with a case of its own, and I prefer the form factor of the full-size AEK. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.